Meltdown details just how the stunning turnaround in the Bush administration's policy towards North Korea in the past couple of years took place. It shows how Assistant Secretary of State Christopher Hill seized control of the policy process, first by violating instructions from his boss, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, and holding unauthorized bilateral meetings with the North Koreans. And then, after winning Rice over to his side by freezing out hardline opponents of engagement. As Hill negotiated with the North Koreans, he and Rice simply kept their bureaucratic rivals in the dark, not informing them in advance of key meetings and presenting agreements only after they'd been reached and Rice had convinced President Bush to go along. The normal interagency process in the government, preparing position papers, drafting talking points, circulating them through the bureaucracy, didn't happen. As one source described it to me, the policy process became Hill calls Rice and Rice calls Bush. Given the intense opposition among the hardliners to any deal with North Korea, this was probably the only way that Christopher Hill could have achieved the diplomatic breakthroughs that he did. But it's left him politically isolated and without a lot of friends and allies in Washington as the negotiating process reaches a critical stage, as has now happened. Meltdown also reveals that the nuclear crisis which erupted in 2002 and which led directly to North Korea testing a nuclear bomb and becoming the world's eighth declared nuclear power might have been avoidable and was to a considerable degree provoked by administration hardliners who spun intelligence about a procurement effort for a uranium program into claims of a full-fledged production capability to make a uranium-based nuclear bomb that did not then and does not now exist. The conventionally accepted narrative is that the U.S. uncovered a clandestine North Korean uranium enrichment program, that Assistant Secretary of State James Kelly confronted the North Koreans about it during a visit to Pyongyang in October of 2002, and that they admitted the charge. This led to the U.S. decision to cut off supplies of oil promised to North Korea in late 2002, triggering Pyongyang's decision to restart the Yongbyon reactor frozen under the 1994 agreed framework deal negotiated by the Clinton administration and then to stage its subsequent nuclear breakout culminating in the 2006 nuclear test. Meltdown shows that in the summer and spring and summer of 2002, U.S. intelligence did discover a North Korean effort to procure the components that could be used for uranium enrichment. But the intelligence found only a procurement effort there was no credible intelligence then, and there hasn't been any credible intelligence since to show that North Korea had or has an actual uranium enrichment facility that would enable it to make a uranium bomb. This is a really critical distinction. Given the enormous technical challenges involved in assembling a working system of centrifuges that could enrich uranium in sufficient quantities to produce nuclear weapons, the CIA in late 2002 believed it would be mid-decade at the earliest and possibly up to 10 more years before any such plant would be fully operational. The longer time frame meant that the issue, while serious, was not an immediate threat, and it might have been possible to negotiate a resolution to the matter without sparking a new crisis on the Korean Peninsula had the Bush administration been willing to negotiate at the time. However, administration hardliners who were intent on killing the agreed framework, which they viewed as appeasement by the wimpish Clinton administration, seized on the issue to force a confrontation. After Vice President Cheney intervened directly with President Bush, the original talking points for Assistant Secretary of State Kelly for that trip in October 2002 were overruled, and he was given instructions for his trip not to negotiate. Instead, his instructions dictated that he simply tell the North Koreans they had to abandon their uranium program before any progress on any other issue was possible. He was also ordered not to observe normal diplomatic courtesies, such as holding a reciprocal banquet for his North Korean hosts, or even making a toast at a meal they hosted for him upon his arrival. Although at the time, Kelly and the other members of his delegation came away convinced that North Korea's first vice foreign minister, Kong suk Ju, had admitted the uranium allegation. Interviews with many members of Kelly's group, plus with others who later saw the transcript, raised serious doubts about whether, in fact, the North Koreans did make that admission. The actual language was much more ambiguous, talking about North Korea's right to have such weapons, but not saying explicitly that they had them. I should point out that the Bush administration continues to refuse to declassify the transcript of that meeting, despite repeated requests under the Freedom of Information Act. In the book, I also note that the North Koreans at the same meeting 
did offer to negotiate a solution to the controversy, but it was an offer that Kelly was under instructions to reject. A secret message from Kim Jong-il to President Bush sent the following month through two American intermediaries, which also urged talks, was ignored by Washington. Finally, Meltdown highlights some key aspects of North Korean behavior. There's a conventional view that Kim Jong-il, the North Korean leader, is crazy and irrational, someone who's impossible to deal with. The reality, based on interviews with a number of people who had met and negotiated with Kim over the years, including former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and South Korea's former President Kim Dae-jung, is rather different. Kim Jong-il is invariably described as smart, shrewd, well-briefed, very much in charge, and throughout the crisis has a clear strategic goal, which is survival. Let me share one anecdote that I think is really revealing about the North Korean mindset. On one of my visits, I was taken to the mausoleum that houses the embalmed remains of the great leader Kim Il-sung, who died in 1994. And when you visit, you join this vast throng of somber-faced North Koreans, and you glide across a moving walkway that runs for almost a kilometer until you reach a series of vast marble corridors. These lead to a giant chamber with a big white marble statue of the great leader illuminated from behind by pink lights to give the effect of the rosy glow of dawn. They love this rosy glow effect in North Korea for some reason. Anyway, you go then up a set of stairs into a cavernous room where Kim Il-sung's remains um, are, are, are under a glass uh, sort of sarcophagus. He's covered with a flag from the chest down. He looks curiously shrunken. Um, and after you pay your respects, you follow the faithful down a set of stairs to a, num a number of other rooms. In one room, the North Koreans have somehow managed to install Kim Il-sung's favorite train carriage, because like his son, he didn't like to fly, and a bulletproof Mercedes given as a gift to his father by Kim Jong-il. And then you get to the final stop, which is the point of this story. It's an exhibition containing some of the 140,000 gifts the great leader received from foreign dignitaries in his lifetime. Among the items on display were a big belt of merit order from the Polish People's Republic, the Order of Freedom First Class from the People's Socialist Republic of Albania, a medal from the Lenin Centenary of the Soviet Union, and the Karl Marx Order from East Germany. And what's striking is how many of these gifts came from states that no longer existed, and from communist leaders like Romania's Nicolae Ceausescu or East Germany's Eric Honecker, Albania's Enver Hoxha, who had been toppled and tossed, in the old communist phrase, onto the dustbin of history. They were all Kim Il-sung's contemporaries. He outlived them all, and his system, for all its weirdness, has outlasted theirs. And now, in the post-Cold War world, deprived of its longtime alliances with the Soviet Union and China, regime survival, keeping the system intact in a hostile world, has become the all-consuming priority of the North Korean leadership. And understanding this issue from Pyongyang's point of view, I believe, is the key to making sense of North Korean behavior today.